for those who don't me, know me, I'm Keegan. Fuck, this is a good start. Uh, but, uh, I'm uh, doing my fourth year and hopefully final year in a Bachelor of Science with a major in Physics here at ANU. And uh, my specialisation is in astronomy, quite specifically in search for extrasolar planets or planets orbiting other stars that we can see. Um, so, I suppose we can start briefly if this mouse will work, which it's not. <laughs> work, please. Hey, okay. Well, I mean, everybody knows this guy. This is Galileo, uh, designer of the very first telescope. Um, we consider him sort of be one of the fathers of what we call modern astronomy. Uh, he discovered the four main moons of Jupiter, uh, Saturn's rings, and the first glimpse of potentially Neptune a long, long time ago. Uh, it was not confirmed until about 200 years later. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, other main key points in what we consider to be modern astronomy, the change from into like a heliocentric uh, system, which is basically all the planets orbiting around the sun, rather than being the Earth being the centre of effectively what we consider the universe at the time. Um, so there were many, many players over the centuries in astronomy. You know, Greece, uh, obviously, uh, Egypt, Ptolemy, um, Rome, India, uh, the Middle East. All these different uh, regions and empires had like greater or lesser parts to play in the history of astronomy. Um, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Um, so, I guess we can move on to... So, there are two main types of telescope that we use these days. The first one here is a refractive telescope. This is what Galilei designed. It's basically a set of different mirrors and lenses in a series that help to magnify the light. So you can actually see, like, perceive something at the end of this tube. So, effectively, just a simple graph there. It's perhaps a little bit complicated, but yeah, it's just bringing a lot of light in, like a bucket. Lots of light enters, it gets adjusted with the lenses and the mirrors, and you can see an image of a star or a planet or something at the other end. Um, most of the very primitive telescopes was used that way because it was easy to make lenses of a similar shape to get a relatively crisp image. These days, however, we use a reflective telescope. So this is slightly different. It's got a similar kind of bucket shape, right? But instead of having different lenses to focus the light, we have all the light coming in and hitting a large base mirror at the bottom, reflected up into a centre one, and depending on how you go, a smaller one like this will be reflected into an eyepiece like this, off to the side for your, you know, regular backyard viewing, or in the case of very, very large telescopes like the one on the next slide here, this one, the Giant Magellan Telescope, it gets reflected into a centre point, basically an eye, into the middle um, mirror. So this one here, this one's destined to be put into service about uh, 2021, uh, it is the biggest telescope of its kind. It's uh, seven, eight meter large mirrors, effectively giving about a 25 meter viewing apparatus. Wait, each of those is seven to eight meters? Yeah, each of those mirrors, this individual seven mirrors, is eight Dino. meters across. Dino. Yeah. So basically, this is going to be huge. It will be able to give beautifully crisp images. It will give images uh, ten times crisper than the Hubble tes telescope that we have currently out in space. Um, obviously we prefer to put things out in space because we don't have uh, atmospheric conditions affecting the vision. We get, you know, heat and things. The best view is viewed in winter when the atmosphere is nice and cold. You don't get these weird lines like you see if you're driving down the road in the desert, you get these kind of ripples and stuff, which is exactly what you see in a telescope. Uh, but this is so big that most of that we can kind of ignore at this point. Um, yeah, pretty much. So this is, this is, we're really looking forward to this when it's eventually built. Uh, yeah, each, um, each mirror is absolutely huge, weighs tons. Uh, but yeah, we're, we look forward to that day in astronomy. Um, all right, next point, we have oh, God. telescopes. Uh, these ones out in space. This is the Kepler satellite. This one was launched about three years ago. Uh, it, was, it uses one uh, photometer at the very top here which is basically just to collect light. It uh, looks at a piece of the sky and just collects all the light uh, from that area. And then we can use the, we create a light curve, or just a graph, I'll show you one of those in a minute. Um, and we can basically learn a lot about that. Um, so uh, this, is, this is sort of the shape of a photometer here. So we get lots of little squares and we can look at each square individually and, uh, and measure the light coming from that area. So we can even point, um, pick out certain stars, certain systems, or nebula, or things like that, to look at uh, how things are progressing over the years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, about two years ago, there was an issue with the Kepler satellite where two of its ro um, 
uh, two of its wheels were basically allowed to have super crucial imaging broke, and NASA basically condemned the project as obsolete. It was not going to be useful anymore. Um, with some uh, amateur scientists said, well, what if you know we continue to use it for its uh, you know potential data that it can retrieve, even though it's going to be a little bit inaccurate, and we try and work on it ourselves, you know, using computer programs and things, try and clean up the data a bit. Maybe we can still use it for something. We've got a satellite out there that's still working. Why not try and use it? Um, and so basically, instead of trying to use super minute adjustments to the telescope itself. Uh, they're going to have to use the thrusters, so that means it's a lot less accurate, get much, you know, uh, broader images. Um, this graph over here is basically just showing, and it's, again, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, it's just um, the satellite can only look at a certain point in space for a limited amount of time uh, because of the fact that it's lost a lot of accuracy and to keep it within, tightly locked with, with the Earth, it can only look for about 72 day period before it has to move on and does a rotation. So we have a very limited time to look at each piece of space. Fortunately, the way it's orbiting around the Earth, we can use it to look at certain key points at certain times of the year. Fortunately for me, that was one week ago. We were looking just above the uh, eastern arm of the um, Milky Way, just, just above it so we don't have a lot of interference, but we can get some beautiful, beautiful images of stars. And that's sort of where I come in. I've been doing research for the past, what's it been, seven weeks now, uh, with some of the research teams up at Mount Stromlo, our local observatory. And uh, we've been using the Kepler data to try and find star, uh, sorry, planets orbiting stars for about four million years, what we consider to be young stars. You know, on the scale of humans, that's huge, but scale of the universe, that's big things. So this is the sort of data that we're looking to receive, or we are currently receiving from Kepler. So you can see it's very, very rough. There's lots of sharp up and down shapes. And that's just because of the units using the thrusters to move back and forth and try and keep the object it's looking at within the, the, the plane that it's looking at. So our job is to kind of reduce this up and down motion and try and get more of a, a focused point for us to actually do any sort of accurate data analysis with, I suppose. Um, so, we've got here. So this is sort of a clean light curve. So this is after we've run it through uh, a program, trying to eliminate as many of the outlying points and a lot of the back and forth we get. This one, I picked this one out for a specific reason. This is the very first, me and my team have found the very first, what we call hot Jupiter orbiting a young star. This has never been before seen before. Here we are, so I'll stick to this side, sorry. So you can see the average light curve, there is still going to be a little bit of fluctuation as to do with the star itself being young and just changing in temperature. Like the sunspots that we see uh, on our own sun, there are dark patches and light patches. And that's what we get here, just this subtle uh, wobble in, in the amount of light that we receive. And here we can see this sudden drop where the values end up significantly lower than the rest of the curve. And we can use this information to work out the size and even the composition eventually of whatever the object is that's passing in front of this star. So doing a little bit of a, a very generic um, uh, analysis of it, we've worked out that it's about a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting in very close proximity, so we'd say about between the orbits of Mercury and Venus. This is very, very new, this is very hot, it's just past the formation, uh, like planetary formation phase. Uh, there's no more, shouldn't be any more ring of dust floating around this new star. Um, but yeah, this is basically, hopefully, hopefully the, uh, the explanation to how our own solar system formed about 7 billion years ago. Alright, so here I'll show you a couple of other graphs of things that we're receiving. And, you know, as I say here, exciting but not quite what we're looking for. So here we have a similar idea, like it has a similar uh, um, look to the previous graph with this big drop in, in terms of the points. But if you look closely, there's also an increase uh, just before and just after in both directions. So what we call this is an eclipsing binary. So this is two stars orbiting around each other. All right? And basically what you get is one will naturally, in most cases, be slightly larger and slightly brighter than the other one. So you'll get it, like the darker one or the, the cooler one will pass in front and you'll get this drop in brightness. We also get these peaks on the other side, which is basically, obviously, the other star still is projecting light. So you get additive and like um, subtractive, I suppose, um, light curves. And on the other side, it's not really shown here, but as the darker star passes to the other side, to us, you'll also get its light passing around, so you get like a double eclipse on both sides. Um, yeah, again, it's... Uh, yeah. I'll move on. 
And uh, here we go, this is another one also. You get a very much an up-down pattern. Looks like there's lots of different transitions, lots of things passing in front. But this is really just a very, very young star, very newly formed. And it's just, as I was mentioning earlier with the sunspots, it's just the star itself changing shape. Imagine the star having about, you know, six, seven different layers in, its, in it in terms of temperature. Sort of like, I imagine the... Uh, the layers of cloud in, uh, in Jupiter, if anybody has seen an image of Jupiter, you can see white and dark lines. Think of that in terms of temperature. Some are going to be hotter than others, and the star is rotating very quickly, so these uh, lines kind of meld in and out of each other, so you get hotter and cooler patches where there's more or less light being received by our telescopes. Um, so again, this is, all of this has to be done by eye. The program itself won't work this out. Uh, and you won't, don't really want to do that either because chances are you'll eliminate a lot of potentials just by trying to do it. So over the past three weeks I've gone over about 4,000 of these by eye trying to look at individual objects and hope that you know one of these will have something that we're looking for. Um, yeah, to greater or lesser extent. So this next uh, diagram here is basically uh, just describing briefly how um, uh, planets and things fall. So there are two kind of competing theories. The one here on the left is the accretion models. This is basically uh, the, there's a big cloud of gas, the star forms at the centre just by the gas collapsing in on itself and becoming very compact, very dense, and therefore increasing in temperature, and suddenly you have fusion that begins and you start getting this hot ball of gas that we know as a star like the sun. Um, slowly but surely you have uh, other pieces of the dust and gas kind of coalesce and build together and you get what we call planetesimals. So these are very, very young planets. They're still mixed between gas and rock and dust and they're just starting to form together. Gravity's slowly starting to take control and create these circular kind of objects. And with this, they start to mop up the rest of the material in this disk floating around the central star until eventually you get what we have today in our solar system where basically pretty well all of the gas and the dust and everything is dissipated. You just have major objects apart from occasionally, you know, the asteroid belt that we have, which is just leftover material from when the, the, the planets formed that many years ago. On the other side, we have what we call our gas collapse model. So it's a similar star, you know, uh, the, planet, uh, sorry, the star in the centre always forms first. That's what creates this swirling motion against everything uh, beginning and creates this turbulence. Um, after that, we have basically, instead of having these planetesimals, which are generally a little bit more on the rocky side, we still have gas giants cre uh, created, like Saturn, like Jupiter, like Neptune, like Uranus, much, much larger formed planets, but with a much higher amount of gas circling around them forming. And they often form fairly close to the centre uh, star and mop up more of the gas. And eventually they start spreading out as their weight increases, the, it's like spinning a bucket, I suppose. The more water you have, the more it's going to want to come out of your hand and fly further away. Similar sort of analogy, I suppose. Um, so that's why we see Jupiter and Saturn and all those really, really big planets are much further out compared to Earth and Venus and things. They don't exist that close to because they just can't keep that fast orbit. Um, all right. And now we'll come to what's called the habitable zone. This is also known as the Goldilocks zone. It's what we consider in astronomy, very arbitrarily, to be the zone, the ideal area in the orbit of a star where liquid water is deemed to exist. So at the top here we have our own solar system. So the Sun, we've set about a one. We use, we use the Sun as, uh, and the Earth as great uh, measuring tools for everything else that we see. We look at a planet, we use it, it's about so many Earths in terms of weight. Or you look at a star and you say, well, there's so many suns in terms of size, so many suns in terms of brightness. We use what we can see and accurately measure as a scale for everything else. Similarly, in this graph, we've got the sun here and the solar system set as basically base one. Um, and you can see here we've got the Earth nicely in this zone with Mars, which is technically still part of it, but as we are continually working to, to discover the, to this day, it's obviously lost its atmosphere at some point due to some phenomena, and is no longer capable of holding life or water or anything else. Um, and we make a parallel here to what's called Gliese 581. So this was the first system that we ever found that had planets within this Goldilocks or habitable zone. Uh, namely, these are Gliese 581G and D. Alrighty. 
Uh, you'll notice in this line here, the planets are not uh, ordered in alphabetical order. Uh, that is because they're not named in order from their star, but in the order in which we discover them. So, um, there are A and B there somewhere, but I think they're much, much further out. They were larger, but yeah, we dismissed them. Um, so, you know, this day, that was three years ago that we found that. Gliese 5 at 1 system was three years ago. Um, and, you know, the Astronomy uh, Society was very excited to find this very first planet that was like Earth, potentially, you know, had water, all this kind of thing. Since then, with further research, we've discovered that it's probably not viable just because of the size of the star and the temperature, it probably didn't form liquid, uh, uh, liquid water at the time. But it was, it was, a, it was a nice, hopeful point and, the fa and um, gave hope that we might find others orbiting other stars elsewhere. Um, and what was I going to say? I don't remember. That's okay. Probably nothing important anyway. Um, so that concludes all the information I've got here in terms of slides right now. I don't know how long uh, it's been going for. Probably 15 minutes. No. Awkward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I tend to get a little bit excited, a little bit uh, hurried when I talk about things that, that excite me a fair bit. Um, but uh, I don't know, what else could I say? Um, not sure. Question time. Yeah, by all means. <laughs> I probably should have said at the beginning, if any of you have a question, you feel free to interject, because uh, I could just go on for days. Uh, so does anybody have a question about anything? Or? Yeah. Um, since we discovered that one in the Goldilocks zone, yes. we discovered more? We have. Uh, one fact I didn't uh, say earlier was that to, um, to this day we have found 1,800 extrasolar planets. So these are planets that we have confirmed exist and are planets orbiting other stars. Of those, how many actually have water and are within the habitable zone is still upon debate uh, because we can, we can work out the composition of these planets but with only a certain degree of certainty. So until we get better telescopes like perhaps the giant Magellan one and uh, you know, hopefully another Kepler satellite that doesn't break this time, uh, we might be able to hopefully uh, find another planet that does have liquid water like Earth. Um, a few that I found in part of my research, some of these were Kepler, so I should say beforehand, Kepler itself, the satellite Kepler that has recently broken, found 1,000 of those 1,800. So it has been absolutely instrumental, fundamental in this discovery of extrasolar planets. Um, hopefully, you know, um, oh, and another 3,000 he's supposed, but they have to go through by human eye to discover whether they are in fact others, or like the other graphs you saw, just eclipsing binaries or rotating stars or things. There's still a lot of work for astronomers like, like me and other undergraduates and master's degree students to, to work on to try and see how much more we, we can discover, um, but uh, it was absolutely fundamental in this side of, uh, of astronomy. Is there any way to tell what's in those planets outside our solar system? Or are we just guessing the mass? As in, in terms of composition, yeah. water, yeah. rock, yes we can. Um, we can actually take, using the spectroscopy and the, the light curves that you saw earlier, we can actually run it through a, an absorption line. And basically if we take out of the fact that there is what we call uh, a redshift. So basically as light travels a long distance, the light will move towards the infrared side of the colour spectrum. So it means that everything, the entire spectrum is shifted. Uh, so if we can counter that out and bring it back to what, the, what we consider to be the you know, visible light leaving the planet, we can work out what kind of composition that planet has. Whether there's water, whether it's highly granite, highly basalt, you know, um, nitrogen, uh, these kinds of things, all these main elements, we can, we can work that out. Uh, it just takes a lot of time and a lot of um, uh, manpower, I suppose, to, to work through it, because that's one planet at a time. You don't need more data? Um, no, so we can get a good idea as to some of the main components, but, you know, like small percentages of things you would not work out. You would have, you have absolutely no idea. But, you know, you can say, well, it's highly carbon concentrated, or there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, or things like that. We can work that much out. Finer details are a little bit, uh, a bit iffy, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yes. Earlier, when you were talking about how um, different galaxies formed, and you were showing us the data, you said that you were studying and trying to find certain stars and planets formations that are not very old. Forty thousand million? No, I said. So I, uh, I think I gave you the value about six million years. Okay. Uh, but yes. How does that help 
kind of figure out how old Owl's, Owl kind of galaxy was formed, or <laughs> like, how does... Yes. Okay, so the issue with astronomy... <laughs> I can't the, push. Yeah, that's all right. The issue with astronomy is because of how old everything is, and because everything only seems to happen sort of once, and we can only look back so far, we need to look at young things to work out what happened in the future. So, for example, we only know, in our solar system, we only know what we can see. We don't know what happened beforehand. We can make estimates, we can make theories, but until we see it actually happening elsewhere, we have no clue. So, same thing with the Big Bang, for example. We, we assume the Big Bang is real and that's how it happened because everything seems to point towards it. But until we have anything proving that, we can't be sure. So, by looking at these very, very young stars, what we consider to be young, about 2 to 10 million years old, we can see the beginnings of planet formation. So, going from just a cloud of dust and gas to the beginning of the star forming and these planets beginning to, to coalesce. Uh, so that helps explain our own solar system and others, and maybe if we study them enough, we may be able to start creating um, trends, I suppose. Uh, so if this cloud of gas looks like this, it's very rich in this kind of material, we can expect to look at like this in about six million years. Not that we'll be alive to see it by then, but it just gives us a lot of forewarning and a bit of knowledge about, you know, the expanse of the universe and what surrounds us in a very distant scale. How do we know how old it is? It seems to be like we're trying to tell how old it is from yes. what's around it, mm -hmm. and then we're trying to tell what's around it from how old it is. Yes, it's it's, it's a bit of a catch twenty two, I suppose. I um one of the other uh, research teams under my supervisor gave me a presentation the other day on some of the other work she was doing. She was looking more at uh, binary systems rather than planets, like I was. But she came up and she gave a table of um of uh, elements, I suppose, of um, stars or binaries that she'd found during her research. And um, she had, at one point, she had the estimated age of some of these stars, and so she said, it was written for one of them, I remember very clearly because I thought it was ridiculous, was it was four million years with an uncertainty of about 11 million years. <laughs> so it could be anywhere between minus seven million years, not even existing yet, to up to 15 million years. And this is the sort of issue that we're coming to, is that we are seeing these things, but we're not really sure. We can make suggestions and estimates, but we have no real concrete proof exactly. We, we're only assuming from what we've seen previously. Again, this is going back to the lack of knowledge and understanding that we have about the universe, is we can only scale it to what we've seen previously. Everything is, we saw this like this somewhere else. This looks similar, so we can guess it's about the same thing, but it might not be. So for you, is that more of a frustration or a mystery? Um, like the mystery element. A bit of both, I suppose. There's a little bit of, you know, everybody pulls out this, you know, random figure out of nowhere and it's like, well, that seems a little bit strange. Like, I'm not sure where you got that from. But, sure, there's definitely some sort of, I want to go further. Like, it's weird, so I want to know why it's weird. Why does it pertain to seem weird to me? Is it, we, have we just made an error? Or is this really something that we have yet to see? Like, we've never seen before. We'll have to find out. Yeah? Sorry, me again. That's okay. Please. I forgot the name, but the new telescope that's huge. The giant Magellan? Yeah. That thing. What are the potential real world like applications of that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you was going to ask questions, but <laughs> 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 um, how will it give us money? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, desktop backgrounds. <laughs> used images of like the Andromeda Galaxy as a background desktop for my uh, computer, but yes. Um, <laughs> unfortunately in astronomy, when it comes to uh, gaining money, you're not in the right field. <laughs> a lot of astronomy comes to government grants and uh, student funding, that kind of thing. A lot of that is the government saying, well, your project is interesting more for the, you know, the advancement of, of technology and understanding, so we'll give you so many million dollars a year to pursue your project. Um, and that's also, I suppose, a very hard thing for astronomers as well. Uh, one of the things I did as part of my degree was we had to write up a mock telescope time application. So this is, there's only so many telescopes in the world, and there are 10, 20 times that many research teams out there all trying to fight for time on a particular telescope during a particular time of year. So you need to sell your project to someone in particular, the owner of the telescope or the organisation that owns it, that runs the thing, to say, you want us to use your telescope during this time and not them. 
So, yeah, it's not just because you think you may have been onto something, if you don't sell it well, you're not getting anywhere. And unfortunately, to answer your question, there's not really a lot of, you know, money uh, to be gained in astronomy unless we find another planet like we found several years ago. The theory is that it's a planet whose core is entirely one giant diamond. So eventually, uh, to so be eventually fair, if we can get there, there we can mine it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what my capitalism is about. Um, as a counterpoint though, there is, um, at the moment, there's a lot of money being invested into basically um, like planet, interplanetary mining. So there's all these new uh, businesses opening up who are basically saying, come sign with us, and eventually when we have the technology to travel oh, through space, nice. <laughs> we will make the satellite, or we will make the ship, if you can design it, that will take us to this place and will mine all the material from this planet. But they're basically preparing in advance for when eventually we have the technology. They have all these sponsors and people paying the money to get them there. But, you know, who knows when that'll be? 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, who knows? Uh, it's very much, uh, you know, uh, looking towards the future, I suppose. Hoping that their investments pay off in the long run. Any other questions? Yep. You went from your raw to clean data. What kind of filter are you using? Alright, so uh, different teams are diff using different uh, filters. Um, we, we are currently using uh, a Python program. Uh, written in conjunction with my supervisor and I uh, to basically remove a lot of that. Uh, but there are teams using Fortran, there are teams using uh, C, uh, different um, programming languages, languages essentially um, to, to, to clean up this data, I suppose. Can I the other one? Yeah, what's the yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm trying to steal all my secrets. <laughs> um, we are using a, uh, a Boxley Squares algorithm at the moment to, to clean this up. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's basically separating the light curve into lots and lots of little columns, summing up all the points, and then if anything breaks away from basically a median strip, it'll remove them and just get eliminate all these points. Uh, we also are doing like a uh, normalizing of the curve as well, just to try and reduce the, the points. I feel like uh, I don't have it here, but uh, I found I came across a graph the other day, basically comparing the data receiving from Kepler before it broke when it was in ideal situations. Uh, compared to what we're receiving now, and it's quite amazing the difference in, in accuracy. Like, it was pinpointing light and, and objects, you know, millions of light years away, whereas now you're lucky to receive anything at a tenth of that distance. Like, it's, it's severely reducing the accuracy, unfortunately, of the cell telescope. So what's that mean in regards to publishable results? Well, it definitely minimises our search field. We can only look at small pieces of sky. Uh, and for shorter periods of time, because previously it was able to focus and readjust a lot better. So looking at one point in space, we could look for a lot longer time compared to now, which I think I said about four, uh, 72 days, uh, which means that, for example, uh, when we're looking at stars and transits, which is what we're looking at now, is the star, the planet travelling between us, and it's just a dull of the, of the brightness. Uh, if it's a very large orbital period, like even Pluto or something, we'd miss it, or we'd see it come across once. So those results are inconclusive unless we can come around and look at it again in something else. But if it's like we saw here earlier with the, um, the hot Jupiter I saw, because it's that close to in orbit to its star, it means that within that 72 day period it gets at least two transits, if not three, four, five. So it means that we've got much more concrete results. We say, well, there's definitely something passing here and here and here and here, rather than one. You could just say it's an error. Something passed between the, uh, the, the star and us. It could be an asteroid or something ridiculous, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. The more points, as with anything, the more data points you have, the more accurate your curve is going to be. So it's still considered statistically significant in regards to... Yes, why? well, it's, if there's only one, if there's yeah. only one transit, it's worth looking at and perhaps worth going further with. Whereas if you find five, it's much more concrete. You say, well, there's definitely something here. You can look at something further as well, but that's more, that's going to take priority in the list. That'll be top number one. Whereas one trans would probably be, you know, at the towards the bottom. It's probably not worth looking at right now unless some astronomer has got, you know, some undergrad student has got an extra three hours on his, t on his time to look at it. Um, yeah, pretty much. Are there no other satellites or missions or anything that can sort of substantiate your, your findings sometime in the future? Um, <sighs> The issue is, I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope, until the Great Magellan is, is built, the Hubble Space Telescope is currently our best imaging piece of technology, satellite, uh, telescope, anything. It's the best that we have at this point in time. And its aperture is only 2.2 metres. 
So I mean, you know, it's still big compared to me, but compared to this giant um, jungle that we're building at the moment, it's insignificant. So we can get good results up to a certain point, but it is limited by the fact that it's only that big. And it's, it was the biggest it could be to actually fit in the shuttle that took it up. It couldn't be any bigger and actually still fit. So, you know, hopefully in a, you know, maybe a few years there may be a, a larger one going up into space, but we can't be sure. That's up to NASA and the ESA and you know, all these other organisations to decide. Anybody else? Yeah? Who's building the Magellan? So the Magellan is, um, it's a combined project between several different organisations. It's currently being built in the mountains in Chile. Uh, very high altitude, I think it's about 2,500 metres high, so it means it reduces a lot of the, um, the atmospheric conditions. Um, I'm pretty sure the original plan was being built by NASA, but since the, uh, the cutting yeah. cuts in funding, I'm not 100% certain uh, who has taken over the project. I feel like NASA still has their, you know, their foot in the door uh, to be part of it, but I don't know to what extent. I'm sure the European Space Agency surely has, to some degree, uh, you know, uh, Interesting. The, the kilometre array. Square kilometre array, yeah. yes. Yeah. So the square kilometre array, for those that don't know, is basically, it was originally going to be built either in South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand. They couldn't decide between the three, so they're building a bit of everything in each. So share the lot of this. So basically it's three major components. So we have uh, a small, uh, low frequency and high frequency radio telescopes. Uh, I could not tell you which part of which is going into which country at this point in time. It's currently being built in all three areas. We're hoping that it'll go into beta testing next year. Um, and the third one is a much larger set of telescopes, also radio, but a different bandwidth. I think they're microwave or something like that. Um, and it's similar. It's not quite the same as the Magellanic because that's um, well, mirrors and things, that's more like uh, imagery, whereas um, radio telescopes are more uh, for different research. You're not going to get an image with a... Uh, with a the launch on them. Microwave. <laughs> <laughs> some ramen. I think you might need to look You're talking to the uni students about ramen. <laughs> no, this is not exactly. true. That's my point. <laughs> If you just walk a little bit closer up to the star, <laughs> it's emitting the microwave, then... <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit closer. Yeah. So how do they tell how far away things are? Alright, so um, we can do that with the red shift that I was talking about earlier. So all light travels at a constant speed, what we call celerity speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, and from there, we can see the light receiving us, we can look at it at the full scale of, of um, wavelengths. And remove the red shift from it and we can work out the distance uh, from us the star is or the planet or the whatever it is that you're looking at basically it's just an inverse law of the, uh, of the red shift theorem but how do we know exactly how much red shift like you were saying before you use yeah so um, basically if you know the distance you can work out the red shift and inversely if you can you can work out the red shift using the speed of light and you can work out the distance it's like a three piece it's like a triangle law When the awesome new telescopes build, how many astronomers are going to go party? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what it finds. I suppose it's like SETI, you know, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, there's lots of people that are, you know, hoping that eventually they'll find something. You can actually download, um, like, an applet that will basically steal some of your bandwidth that's a tiny amount um, each day or whatever, as long as you've got the program running, and it'll just add to the total processing power of SETI for trying to find life out in the universe. Um, and so basically it's, it just purely runs on however many people are, are using the app at any one time. Just because it's using you know, 10 megabytes of your data, uh, but you multiply that by a million people and suddenly you've got a quite a significant amount of processing power. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's uh, really dependent on what the finds are. We're hoping it'll uh, definitely advance astronomy as a whole and find us lots of great amazing things to study for and, you know, uh, there'll be lots more undergrad astronomy students like me, but who knows? It may just be a great piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, would you say that you have to be really, very um, philosophical in your approach compared to, say, other sciences because um, because there are, like you were saying before, there is such a huge range and you don't really know how old things are? And, like, would you say you're a little more philosophical than, say, you know, biology? Or? 
philosophical, possibly more sceptical, I would say. Okay. Uh, you have to take everything that you find with, uh, like, I suppose, uh, with a grain of salt. You need to look at it and say, hey, that looks cool, it might be something, but it might not be. So, you need, we need to go further, we need to do more research. You publish a paper, you say, look what I found, you know, does anybody else find the same thing? And, um, yeah, so, inversely, I suppose, when it comes to, you know, the philosophy side of things, you know, there's a lot of debates about what we find in, in, in even space, you know, even uh, the conspiracies about the moon landings, everybody's going to say, well, where's the proof? Um, and yeah, it's definitely, it's an uphill struggle, is slowly but surely proving all these things that we can only find with minutest evidence that this does in fact exist. We have seen this. The photos that you see of nebulas, of uh, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, all these things, they are concrete. They are, they do exist. Maybe the colours have been changed slightly, but they are concrete things that we have found. Um, yeah, it's... It's not always easy to, 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 to convince people that what we are finding is real, real evidence. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? No? How many moons does Jupiter have that could have water? How many moons does Jupiter have? Well, first of all, how many moons does Jupiter have? Uh, we're seeing about about 120 moons at this point. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's pretty significant, and uh, Saturn is fairly close behind at about 84. Um, and 30 of those were found about a year ago, all in one go. They just happened to be observing Saturn and said, Oh, what are all these extra objects floating around? <laughs> uh, yeah, like, where did these come from? Yeah. Uh, part of that is obviously the, um, the ring around Saturn, like, coalescing together, kind of like the rings around uh, newborn stars. Uh, but to answer your question, um, not certain. There are some with ice, uh, but it's a mix of ice and dust and that kind of thing. Uh, so usable water, especially liquid water, is probably hard to find. At that distance, it's not hot enough for there to be any liquid water. Ice is more prominent. For example, you've got certain moons like the, the Galilean moons I was talking about earlier. Um, Callisto and Ganymede, I think, both have icy structures on them. Uh, one of them is basically entirely enveloped by ice, but it's a mix of water, ice, and methane ice. So trying to extract one from the other is rather difficult. Um, so unfortunately it's things like that, is you're never gonna, uh, like Earth is very ideal, obviously that's why we're all here, but um, uh, you know, find water in its current state like we find on Earth is very, very difficult. It's so pure, it's so, so um, uh, removed from everything else. It's not a mix of that and, you know, nitrous oxide or anything like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> just watch the entirety of Earth go up in flames. Um, yeah, pretty much. So we have to find one one day that does, in fact, have similar qualities to Earth. But uh, unfortunately, Jupiter's a little bit far away. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm, I'm happy to answer questions all day. Um, <laughs> Shall we clap? Yeah. <laughs>